let me sketch for you a proof of the theorem of inclusion and exclusion. There are several ways we could go about doing this. But let me pick one way which has a salutary value of being particularly useful as a way of thinking about these problems. And it has got the ancillary benefit of being particularly useful in the advanced theory. The idea borrows from the old magician standby. Pick a card, any card. We're going to try to do the same thing with our view now from a sample point. So let's begin with a collection of n events, a1 through an, in some probability space. We will not worry now about whether there are any dependency constraints between these events or not. It does not matter. For our purposes, these are arbitrary events in a probability space. Let's put together indicators for the occurrences of these events. So let's say that x1 is the indicator for the occurrence of the event a1. In other words, x1 is equal to 1 if a1 occurs, and x1 is equal to 0 otherwise. x2, likewise, is the indicator for the occurrence of the event a2. And proceeding along these lines, generically, let's write x sub j for the indicator for the occurrence of the event a sub j. Now, Recall that the inclusion-exclusion principle devolved upon various inclusion-exclusion sums, and the notation was formidable. But the concept at heart was elegant and simple. Let's say we fix any value k between 1 and n. Pick any collection of k out of the n events. It's an arbitrary collection, so let's tag them with generic indices, j1, j2, j3, through j sub k. Look at the probability of the intersection of those k events. Now, some such probabilities over all choices of k events out of n. And that is all that that formidable-looking sum represents. sk, in words, is the sum of all k-wise intersection probabilities of the underlying events a1 through an. Of course, k here is a generic integer between 1 and n. In our inclusion-exclusion formulations, we're going to see terms like sk, sk plus 1. Well, what is sk plus 1? Well, simply in that formulation, replace k by k plus 1. In other words, add all k plus 1-wise intersection probabilities. If you replace k by k plus 2, then simply add all k plus 2 y's intersection probabilities, replacing k by k plus 2 in the sum. And likewise, sk plus j for a generic j would be the sum of all the k plus j y's intersection probabilities. Replace k by k plus j in the sum. Good. With this in place, here is the generic principle of inclusion and exclusion. The principle says something about the number of occurrences of these underlying events a1 through an. If you look at the sum of the indicators, x1 plus x2 plus x3 through xn, this sum will just flag whichever events occurred. You'll get a 1 precisely when that event occurred. And therefore, the sum will give you exactly the number of occurrences of the events a1 through an. So on the left-hand side, what you discover is the probability that the number of occurrences takes some given value k. k, of course, is arbitrary. It could be a number between 0 and n. On the right-hand side, we get an alternating sum. And it looks complex, assuredly. But what we take away from this is, atop all those binomial coefficients which appear on the right, what we're seeing are the terms which involve the k-wise intersection probabilities, the k plus 1-wise intersection probabilities, the k plus 2-wise intersection probabilities, and so on and so forth. The high-level principle here is this. If it turns out that intersection probabilities are relatively easy to compute in the problem, then these probabilities for the distribution 
for the number of occurrences of these events is now readily computable. Perhaps not in closed form, but at least numerically computable. Of course, the simplest of these settings, we'll remember, is when we have independence, because an intersection probability is just evolve into products. The great worth of this principle is this is going to take us beyond independence. Even in settings where the events are not independent, but the degree of independence is not severe. If it is mild, then perhaps we have a chance of computing intersection probabilities, perhaps by dint of a little more effort. And if we can do that, then we can compute the distribution of the number of occurrences. Okay, so here, for the first time in our entire sequence of lectures, we are hitting upon a theoretical principle which will allow us to move beyond independence, albeit in a modest way, towards mild dependence. Okay, so this is the setting and why this kind of structure would be important. How do we go about verifying a formulation like this? Now, in the case when k was 0, then we are targeting the question, the problem, of what is the probability that none of these events occur? And you'll recall from our context in sieves, if these events a1 through an reflect bad events, then we're asking what's the probability of the occurrence of something bad? Venn diagrams proved to be particularly efficacious in that setting, and we could almost read out the inclusion-exclusion formula by overcounting, undercounting, overcounting, undercounting, and edging up to a solution. We could progress along similar lines for a general formulation, but as I promised you, we're going to take a different tack here. The tack of the magician, take a card, any card, in our context, fix any value k, and pick any sample point, say little omega. This at least has a salutary value of forcing you to ask what is the basic underlying sample space for the problem, the very first question we should have started with. Starting with that, pick a sample point, any point. Now, this sample point will reside in maybe none of the events, A1 through An, perhaps in one of those events, perhaps in, say, L of them, where L is any number between 0 and n. Pick a sample point and ask this equation. How much does this sample point contribute to the left-hand side of the equation and to the right-hand side? If it contributes an equal amount to the left and to the right, and this is true for every sample point, then we'll approve the principle of inclusion and exclusion. So let's directly start by saying, the selected sample point, whatever it is, is in a certain number of these events, a1 through an. Let us say L, where L is a number between 0 and n. What can we conclude? Well, let's identify which L of the events this omega actually is in. Of course, I don't know ahead of time which L. Let's give them generic names. Let's say omega lies in the events a sub j1 and also in A sub J2, and so on, and also in A sub JL, and in none of the others. All right, now we've identified which of the events omega triggers, which of the events this particular outcome is favorable for. And the moment you tell me that the particular sample point omega that we have selected lies in these L events, then we know that the number of events that occur is exactly L. Or in other words, in a slightly more verbose mathematical language, the sum of the indicators x1 through xn is L because precisely L of the x's take value 1 and the remaining take value 0. The x's pick out exactly which events occur when omega is the outcome. Excellent. Now, once we understand this, now we've got an equation. If omega is an L of the events, then we know that the event on the left is triggered precisely when L is equal to k. Remember, k is some fixed value. There are now three cases, and here they are. 
the number of events that omega lies in could be either smaller than k, equal to k, or larger than k. We should take this in turn, and so let's promptly do this.